Good evening. In the last hour, police investigating the suspected poisoning of a Russian spy and his daughter have said they're treating it as attempted murder. They say they were specifically targeted and the substance is believed to have been a nerve agent. They have also revealed this evening that a police officer is now also in a serious condition in hospital. 66-year-old Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia remain critically ill. Well, let's go live there now to Kerry Swain, who's been following today's developments. Kerry, what more can you tell us about the update from police today? Well, Fred, as you say, within the past half an hour, the Metropolitan Police in London have issued a detailed statement. What we know so far is that the couple were targeted with a nerve agent, although the police won't say exactly what type of substance was used. But despite this, there's no evidence, they say, of a widespread health risk to the public. Hundreds of police officers, scientists and analysts are now working on the case, and this case is now being treated as attempted murder. I can also confirm that we believe the two people originally who became unwell were targeted specifically. Our role now, of course, is to establish who is behind this and why they carried out this act. To that end, we have hundreds of detectives, forensic specialists, analysts and intelligence officers working together around the clock on the case. Dramatic events in London, here in Salisbury, it's been another tense and difficult day with much of the city cordoned off and a large police presence. Sudden drama in Salisbury, sirens, ambulances and fire engines blocking the street. The focus of this emergency, a small office block next to the Italian restaurant which has already been closed by the police. A woman guided into an ambulance, followed by another. Really scary because you don't know what's going on, you don't know who's next, you don't know um, what's caused it to start with, you don't know what's, what's coming, you don't know what's around the corner. But it does seem to be affecting the community because I've just been to try and shop at a uh, shop in the Maltings and it's closed of course. Well it's just a bit worrying because like I say there's hundreds of people here gathering around just trying to see what's going on. You think, oh, is there something in the air? <laughs> Who knows? These CCTV pictures show the former Russian spy Sergei Skripal only five days before his sudden collapse, buying milk, a baguette and a lottery ticket. The owner of the corner shop still has his most recent winning ticket, just four pounds. She was about to order Russian food for him. Very nice person, like grandfather always smiles and very polite, uh, very nice customer. When I see, you know, the, on the newspaper what happened, I really feel very sorry for him. Sergei Skripal joined this small social club in November, a safe space for a quiet man few remember. You know, it's, there's a certain element of shock, there's a certain element of surprise that something like this could happen in a sleepy little place like Salisbury. The bench where Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia were found collapsed is still covered. Information is emerging about their movements on Sunday. They left his house in Salisbury at 1 and went to Zizi's to eat. Between 2.15 and 2.30 they left and walked to the nearby Mill pub. Both places remain shut, the centre of investigations. There's a lucky horseshoe on the Skripal house in Salisbury, but this family has known nothing but tragedy in recent years. Mr Skripal's wife, brother and son have all died. His son's sudden death in Russia last year considered suspicious. Well, Sergei and Yulia Skripal and a police officer who was first on the scene remained critically ill in hospital this evening. Police are appealing to the public for help. They'd like to hear from anybody who has footage in Salisbury Town Centre on Sunday and specifically they want to hear from anybody who was in Zizi's Italian restaurant or the Mill Pub. Gary Swain in Salisbury, thank you. And our reporter David Wood is at Westminster for us now. David, what more can you tell us about the COBRA meeting held today? 
Sangeeta, I think it shows just how seriously the government wants to be seen to be taking what happened in Salisbury over the weekend and the investigations that have happened after it. The COBRA uh, emergency meeting, it's actually named after the room they meet in. These sort of meetings are only held after major events like terrorist attacks and flooding, for example. It was chaired by the Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, but other senior ministers were there, including the Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, the Defence Secretary, Gavin Williamson, and crucially also the Health and Social Care Secretary, uh, Jeremy Hunt, because of the potential public health impacts involved in this investigation. Now, they're all brought together as well as with representatives of the intelligence agencies to update everyone on the investigation and where the investigation will be looking over the next few days to make sure that all of the government departments are working together and helping each other. They wouldn't be drawn on what was discussed, although I understand they were given very detailed uh, specifics about the investigation so far. But the Home Secretary did give us this update. This is likely to be a lengthy and ongoing process. We need to make sure that the police and the other services have the space to continue that investigation. We need to keep a cool head and make sure that we collect all the evidence we can. And we need to make sure that we respond not to rumour, but to all the evidence that they collect. And then we will need to decide what action to take. Now, after that meeting, I was at a briefing with the Prime Minister's official spokesman. He would not be drawn on whether ministers and investigators knew what the exact substance was, but he also wouldn't deny that they knew. All we've been told is that it was some sort of nerve agents that pose a very low risk to public health. Now, the Prime Minister updated the House of Commons at lunchtime today as part of her weekly Prime Minister's questions. Uh, there were also tributes to the emergency service workers uh, from the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn. Let's have a little listen and to pay tribute to the work of all the emergency services who responded at the scene. The police investigation is ongoing. Yesterday afternoon I chaired a meeting of the National Security Council where we were updated on that investigation. I think we all thank the emergency and security services for their response and we await updates on the progress of investigations into the cause of that incident. Representing a South West constituency, can I align my remarks with those of my right honourable friend? The incident in Salisbury has clearly caused great concern across the South West and across the country. There is clearly a lot of concern, as you can see, uh, amongst government and also members of parliament here. Now, the Home Secretary was repeatedly asked earlier on whether there are other any former Russian agents that she believes could also be at risk. She wouldn't give a specific example, but did stress that we are all action is being taken to make sure all of us are being kept safe. You may remember uh, last night, I suggest the government really has a diplomatic fine line to toe in being aggressive towards Russia, but also understanding that Russia may not be involved. I think a day on, it's more like a tightrope the government is walking tonight. David, thank you. Well, just seven miles away from Salisbury is Porton Down, where the testing on that nerve agent has been carried out. From there, Sally Simmons sent this. Well, this site is infamous for carrying out nerve gas experiments on humans over decades. But today it specialises in defence research, much of it top secret. It's here that samples of Ebola have been sent. It's here that samples of sarin from Syria have been analysed. And it's here that samples were sent from Sergei Skripal. And today it's been confirmed that it is a nerve agent. These pictures from Port and Down's own archives show tests of deadly agents just after World War II. The site was set up in 1916 when our soldiers died from gas attacks. And laboratories here have handled the world's most deadly chemical and biological agents ever since. The Defence Science and Technology Laboratory at Port and Down has been examining samples from Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia, testing for trace amounts of chemicals. When Alexander Litvinenko was poisoned in 2006 in a hotel in Mayfair, it took three weeks to work out what the substance was. Geiger counters failed to pick up radioactivity, although the fact that his hair fell out strongly suggested radiation. Samples were sent to the atomic weapons establishment at Aldermaston in Berkshire. There, alpha rays, stopped by skin, undetectable by Geiger counters, were found to match polonium only a microscopic amount was used. You only need a tiny amount um, to be poisoned. The amount of polonium discovered in his blood 
was 26 micrograms, that's a millionth of a gram, and that was enough to kill him. It's the combined effort of our doctors, public health, and the expertise in our research laboratories that means we are among the best in the world at solving these mysteries. 3,000 scientists work on this site and will carry on their work over the next few days. Well, let's speak to a toxicology expert, Professor Alastair Hay, in our ITV Leeds studio. Professor Hay, thanks for joining us. Now, Porton Down has been at the centre of the testing of this substance. What kind of tests will they have been carrying out? Well, Porton Down is set up to carry out uh, tests specifically on chemical warfare agents, but it has the capability of testing for a wide range of substances. It has state-of-the-art equipment. It is world-renowned for its quality because it's involved in so many quality control exercises with other countries. So anything that comes out of the laboratory, you can be fairly certain that it's correct. How good is the UK in this particular field? I mean, are we at the top of our game? Well, we certainly are. The UK has been instrumental in developing tests for biological fluids. Quite a lot of chemical warfare testing has been done in the past on soil samples, on scrapings from munitions and the like. But the UK has been leading the field in developing the testing of biological fluids, which is exactly what you want in a situation like this. So they're adept at testing blood, saliva, urine, and looking for all sorts of chemicals or toxins. We've seen lots of people in protective clothing on the streets of Salisbury. What will they have been doing? I think they're just wearing it as a precaution, uh, and that's sensible. And just speculate for me, if you will, does this, as far as you're concerned, has the hand of Russia on it? I think it's too early to say uh, whose hand may be on it. It's premature to blame anybody at this stage. Professor Hay, thanks for talking to us. You're welcome. Well, this story has been all over the media here, leading bulletins and on the front pages of the papers. But what about in Russia? Yes, are they as interested in this too? Well, let's find out from Moscow. ITV's Carl Dinan has sent this. As far as ordinary Russians are concerned, this is not a story they've been hearing a great deal about in the national media. Uh, what little coverage there has been really has focused on what is seen as a, the demonization of Russia by the British media and sources in Britain who are pointing the finger at the Russian regime for this attack. Today, the spokeswoman for the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs said this was a continuation of that program of demonization. Opinion here is divided. There are those who believe that the Russian state could have had some involvement in this attack. There are others who think that Russia is never involved in this kind of illegal activity. And then I think in the center ground, there are those who believe that although it is possible, it's hard to see a clear motive for the Russian authorities, given that this was a man who was held in prison and was pardoned and released. It's not at all clear that uh, the Russians would now have decided that they want to go after him, all of which, of course, points to the absence of clear facts in this case. Carl Dillon there reporting in Moscow. More on this story, of course, in the national news and our late news this evening. You are watching ITV News here in the